Dan Rundy, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and we're, we're having a conversation about the history of modern diplomacy, public diplomacy, and the origins of the founding of USIA. Um, USIA took the lead in the war of ideas between the United States and the Soviet Union following World War II. Uh, the Cold War was arguably won because the U.S. Uh, had uh, a better economic system, that's certainly the case, and because uh, the United States had better ideas and values. Um, the USIA helped uh, present those ideas and values in its public diplomacy campaign, through its public diplomacy campaigns around the world and carried great influence. Um, although USIA itself no longer exists, uh, it's important to reflect upon the origins and the time in which uh, it was started. I think there's certainly a whole series of uh, war of ideas issues that I think we're confronting today, whether it's either violent extremism or sort of a resurgent Russia or a um, uh, res, you know, a, a China as a soft power competitor to the United States. So what I wanted to do, I've been doing this in partnership um, with a program on the history of uh, military history and, and diplomacy. My friend Mark Moyer ran and my friend Mark Hansen is, is, is holding down the fort on. Um, so we've got four distinguished panelists um, who are going to help us kind of unpack sort of the history of this and not just sort of looking back in the memory book on this, but also like what does this mean for today? And so that was my thought as to, given sort of the, that this is in the news, I thought that this would be appropriate. I think you all have seen the bios of the folks that I've asked uh, to speak. Um, we have uh, Nick Cull, uh, we have Greg Tomlin, we have Caitlin Sh Schneider and uh, Betsy Whitaker. Schindler. Schindler, yeah. Schindler, Schindler, Caitlin Schindler, excuse me. So. Uh, let me start. I'm going to ask uh, Nick to start, kick this off, and so. And I think that the context of this is let's look. Let's look back at the history of the formation of USIA and its actions, and what what are some of the lessons that we can draw from the history of public diplomacy and the history of the founding of USIA and its operations, and what what should that be telling us about the world that we're in today? So, Nick, over to you. Well, I think the um, the first thing to say about USIA is that it was created out of pre-existing programs. Uh, it is a um, response to a crisis, uh, the United States feeling challenged by what the Russians were doing, and realizing that it was going to have to pull together its existing programs uh, into some sort of rational form. And um, to be short, I would say that the great insights that come out of USIA and institutionalizing American public diplomacy are that um, effective public diplomacy begins with listening, and USIA was able to have a very effective research component, um, that uh, the best public diplomacy in the world is of no value unless you have an input into policy formation. Uh, and so the struggle at USIA was always to have a input into um, deciding what the country was going to do. Um, without that, you're stuck in a reactive position. That public diplomacy is a profession and that the people need to have uh, special skills, training, and status. And uh, I think part of the achievement of USIA was to move from being seen as an add-on to American public diplom to American diplomacy to being integrated into it. And uh, people know about the foundation of USIA in 1953, but in a way more significant is the moment in 67 when USIA officers moved from being part of the Foreign Service Reserve to being full-fledged Foreign Service officers with pension rights, with the ability to be promoted to ambassador level, and there was an acceptance that public diplomacy is a specialism of diplomacy, not just something that you call in when um, you, you uh, don't like how foreigners are reacting to your um, behavior or, or, your, or your ideas. Um, is that sort of... Yeah, uh, Nick, just good? talk a little bit about what was the... What was the what was the rationale for pulling together USIA? Why did why was it pulled together, at, and what what were the things that policymakers were grappling with at that time? Well, the reason it's pulled together in, um, you know, the, 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 my way of looking at it is that there is an American way of public diplomacy, and that is when you have a crisis, you have to respond to the to the crisis. And the history of American public diplomacy has been what I sometimes call the public diplomacy hokey pokey, where you put your whole self in, but only when there's a crisis, and then.
and when that's it's what over, it's all about. Yeah, then right. when, when it's over, Congress pulls it out because they don't want to fund uh, something as frivolous as talking to foreigners when there, when there isn't an existential crisis. Um, so you can go through the hist history, as I'm sure um, Caitlin will later on, and you know, look at how there were uh, public diplomacy moments associated with the American Revolution, Civil War, First World War. Following World War II, it was clear that the crisis wasn't coming to a convenient end and that the special uh, institutions and operations created for the war would have to, would have to somehow uh, go on. So we would need continuing VOA, continuing um, cultural attaches, continuing uh, re-education in Germany and Japan, and um, information offices in Europe, like had been built for the Marshall Plan. These things would have to go on, and they needed some agency to oversee this work and fill in the gaps. And so USIA was created in 53 as a way of taking some of the political heat out of this because it wasn't only responding to propaganda from Russians overseas, it was responding to propaganda from, full, from, um, from Senator McCarthy at home and to try and bring, uh, take uh, American global engagement off the list of things that were wrong with the federal government. So Eisenhower thought up a way of increasing political control, decreasing the budget, increasing effectiveness for what he called the P factor, the psychological factor in American uh, foreign policy, and uh, it was a, I think it was an interesting idea, an important idea that then grew um, to become an important part of, uh, of um, American foreign policy, and one which is today, um, I think the importance of it is uh, uh, underestimated. Great, thank you, Greg. Uh, you've written a book. Um, around the, around the about the early USIA in the early '60s and Edward R. Murrow. So thanks for being with us, please. Well, thank you again, Dan, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm very. I should take it back. I'm an advocate, I should say, that you have to integrate public diplomacy with national security policy. And there are some debates on this whether it should just be diplomatic. Uh, policy making, if it's okay, if it's just in the State Department, or if it's something that really needs to happen in the National Security Council or at the White House. And there's two historical examples from the Kennedy administration I'd like to share that give you an understanding on how it can be important to be integrated, or it's at your peril if you choose to ignore it. And in April of 1961, Edward R. Murrow had become the director of USIA just a month before, but he was not involved in the decision to conduct the Bay of Pigs operation. And he found out about it by a telephone call by Henry Loomis, who was the director of Voice of America. And he said, Voice of America doesn't know how to respond. We're surprised. The CIA's Radio Swan is saying other things. We simply don't know what guidance we should have. And this was infuriating to Edward R. Murrow. And this is when he said his classic line that if they want me in on the crash landing, then I damn well better be in on the takeoff. And if he had been involved in the takeoff, what they would have found out the month before is that USAA had in their possession at the Office of Research and Analysis a public opinion study done by the University of Princeton in 1960. And they had gone to Havana and they'd gone across Cuba and they found that overwhelmingly, the Cuban people saw Castro as a revolutionary and not as a communist. And this really disputed the underlying argument by the CIA for the Bay of Pigs operation, which was you can send this small brigade of expats onto the island and it will immediately cause this island-wide revolution and they're going to embrace America, democracy, they're gonna oust Castro. And having that piece of information, being able to listen, as Nicole talked about, may still have led the president to continue with the mission. But before that, he should have at least gone back to CIA and said, I need you to refresh your intelligence estimate, because that was the crux of that decision. And potentially, that was wrong. And we can fast forward a few months later to see something that was positive that had to do with public diplomacy and the idea of considering it with the respect to national security policy. And that had to do with the Soviet surprise detonation of a nuclear bomb. They were testing again, even though there were discussions going on in Geneva. And they did this as a surprise. And it was just two weeks after the Berlin Wall came up. And so naturally, Hawks and the Kennedy administration said, you have to respond by having another nuclear test. We have to resume it ourselves. And Edward R. Murrow was the most audible member of the National Security Council that said, do not do this. And he argued it for three points. Number one, the United States has the ability to defend the homeland and its allies with the current nuclear arsenal. And number two, he argued that the Soviets, if you don't respond, are actually hurting themselves. They're the ones who are looking duplicitous. They're the ones who are looking irresponsible. 
And the third piece that came again from his Office of Research and Analysis is that USIA knew that at the same time as this detonation, the non-alignment movement was meeting in Belgrade. And one of the most important pieces that they were talking about was nuclear disarmament and how do you get rid of the arsenals around the world and why the non-alignment movement was advantageous. And Murrow convinced Kennedy that now was not the time to resume the testing. And Kennedy accepted this and he asked uh, Murrow to help write the official White House response where they talked about the U.S. as being this bastion of hope and it worked very well. And they sh showed in other opinions as well that the United States was seen more favorably than the Soviet Union at that point. Now ultimately, Kennedy would resume testing. In three months, the Soviets are going to detonate 50 different nuclear munitions. And Murrow continued to say, you cannot do this. And the president looked at him and said, they've spit in our eye. I have to respond. But it wasn't that he at that point said, I'm not gonna consider public diplomacy any longer. In fact, Edward Murrow and his deputy Don Wilson continued to be involved in the discussion, and they helped to add things such as, why don't we have the press come to one of the tests? Why don't we show how we do it safely? Why don't we show how we are different from the Soviet Union in this process? And he gave guidance as well to Voice of America and other components of USA on how they should explain this to the world. Great, Caitlin Schindler, thanks for being with us. I really would welcome your thoughts about these questions. Okay, um, from my own perspective, I'm gonna take a, um, make remarks in regards to um, more further back in US history um, as my optic goes all the way back to the American Revolution. And um, from my perspective, a lot of what spurred on the creation of the USIA and even that turbulent period between 1945 and 1953, really the crux of that was unresolved issues about what public diplomacy actually was, what role it should play in the United States, and really what function it should perform in relation to not only to U.S. foreign policy, but also U.S. foreign relations. Um, and a lot of that was also shaped, um, and at least from my perspective and looking at U.S. historical experience with public diplomacy, um, by what I would call almost historical baggage or experience and ideas that kind of continue to weigh in on not only public diplomacy, but U.S. foreign relations writ large. Um, Nick talked about how public diplomacy is like uh, only used uh, in moments of crisis. Um, and I talk about it as a tool of last resort um, rather than the tool of first resort. And as an example, and a very early example of this, um, things were not going well between the British and the colonies. And uh, King George III actually issued a proclamation making it illegal for any of the colonies to correspond with people in Britain. And the Continental Congress, in response to this, uh, created what they called the Committee for Secret Correspondence. And if you read the text of that, that kind of um, passage or uh, agreement that the Continental Congress made, it is for corresponding with our friends in other nations to kind of explain the colony's position. And uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of the members of that committee, and they used a lot of his network over in Europe in order to um, make contact with important individuals across Europe, and contacting people from his time as a scientist and a printer. Um, another example where the U.S. kind of sought um, public diplomacy as a tool of last resort um, is um, with the declaration of war and U.S. interests into World War I. Um, Woodrow Wilson received a lot of input from various people, including Walter Lippmann, um, Arthur Bullard, and a couple others. Um, but the thing that really kind of provoked Wilson was that there were I think something like 18 million um, non-American born citizens in the United States, and most of them had come from German country, uh, Germany, or from countries that were uh, affiliated with Germany. And the, the Committee on Public Information was mainly, kind of, or one of the reasons why it was stood up was to kind of address this issue, to explain the U.S. entrance into the war. As the war started to progress and U.S. started to gear up towards uh, moving into Europe, it became apparent that the United States was also going to have to explain to the people of the world uh, the United States' role in the war. And 
uh, again, Wilson got a lot of um, input from various people, including George Creel, who is the committee chair for um, the CPI. And uh, one gentleman who was stationed in Britain actually um, warned the George Creel to be careful about how the US projected itself abroad because Europeans had been subject to propaganda for the better part of five years since the war began. And the United States needed to be careful not to devolve into propaganda, that we needed to keep our messaging news-based or educational. And as I'm sure some of you who are familiar with the history of US public diplomacy, this is kind of a debate that has kind of spurred and churned up again, especially with the creation of the USIA. Just um, the one other remark that I would make um, kind of in ties with not only the creation of the USIA, but also the history of US public diplomacy. The thing that has struck me is the overwhelming recognition of the public's role in foreign relations. And as Bruce Gregory has termed the public dimension of diplomacy and the need to integrate public diplomacy as a standard practice of diplomacy. Um, we think um, today of diplomacy being state to state. In the course of my research and looking at the origins of US public diplomacy, you look at some of the early works on what diplomacy was, what was the role of a diplomat. It included everything from spying to propaganda. Um, obviously, I don't think U.S. ambassadors today would, have, would abide by some of those activities, but certainly some of those activities to reach out to the public of another nation to explain and represent the policies of the, their own nation um, was well within the bounds of their duties and responsibilities. Um, and I think that's the thing that struck me in looking at um, the history of US public diplomacy is how much consistency there is in the idea that this is something that should be a part of US diplomatic practice. It's not anything new. It's not anything scary. It's just something we should be doing. Thank you, Caitlin. Betsy, thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Um, before I begin, let me just say I am not speaking for the Department of State, although they pay me on a monthly basis. Um, uh, I want to pick up from this concept that Nick and Caitlin have advanced, that is, um, of, of public diplomacy. Um, yes, being extremely important. As someone who's spent since 1984 to the present involved in some way with public diplomacy, I do think it's really important. Um, I, I, I love the, the way Nick characterizes the PD hokey pokey, we're in, we're, we're out, or the tool of last resort, and I think that's absolutely true. The, the other piece um, is that, um, and this is, I'm going to quote a little bit from an article written by Seth Center, who is a historian with the Department of State. Who, um, who, said, who said basically the, the golden age of public diplomacy really wasn't that golden. He said, if you look at congressional hearings on the subject for the late 1980s, you will see issues familiar to present day PD practitioners. The challenge of measuring effectiveness, the impact of budgetary limitations, the lamentation that PD was not well integrated into the policy making process. Congress raised questions about the responsiveness of chiefs of mission to PD priorities, the impact of terrorism on PD officers' ability to do outreach in the field, and the role of authoritarian governments in impeding U.S. programs. Throughout the Cold War, the PD apparatus was a regular target of reform studies, and its budgets were under constant scrutiny. Public diplomatists wrestled with the balance between unapologetic messaging and building two-way bridges through intercultural communication. The U.S. Information Agency rarely had a seat at the table in policy deliberations. For anybody who's been in the field, in the diplomatic field, this, this is not new. This is, this is sort of the, the status quo ever. Um, and I think if we put this in perspective, I mean, well, let's, let's stop for a second. Let's be honest. Diplomacy is something, I would argue, that is little understood by the average American. Um, we all, we who are in the Foreign Service all have our stories of going home and telling, you know, meeting your neighbors and friends and so forth, and you tell them, I work for the State Department, and often they say, which state? Um, and, so, and, B Betsy, I'm sorry, so you're saying it's not just eating canapes and drinking champagne at receptions? Well, it's mostly that, but yes. Just trying to be clear. Thank you for that perspective. <laughs> Keep us all honest. Here. Right. 
but the fact is that it's so, it, it, you know, and the people we elect to represent us uh, reflect this perhaps lack of information, this lack of knowledge. Again, this is, as my husband would say, this is not a criticism, it's an observation. <laughs> Gives you an insight into my 35-year marriage. Um, but if you add to that the persistent dis discomfort with the role of government in communicating with foreign audiences, you, you sort of have, I think, this perfect recipe for inadequately informed policymaking about public diplomacy that is chronic. Um, and I think we are still in it today. I think those of us, and I see many familiar faces here, I think those of us who served with the USIA before its consolidation in 1999 agree it was a functional government silo. And I mean every word of that. Um, it, we understood our mission. We, it was a relatively small organization which allowed for nimbleness and creativity and a sense of community. Ours was largely an unclassified world and a relatively flat organization. And it was a functional arrangement, but it was a silo. It worked well in the field, or it worked better in the field, thanks to country team, where you had a smaller universe of, of players. It did not work so well in Washington. So the decision to reap a peace dividend after the end of the Cold War by consolidating USIA into the Department of State, in my view, was not necessarily a bad idea. But it was made more as a political horse trade than anything, more so than a result of any long strains to long range strategic vision about the future of PD. It culminated a decade of wrenching budget cuts, reorganization efforts, and the elimination or reductions of programs and staffing. The silver lining, if you ask me, of the consolidation or the merger was that it put PD in the building, as we talk about the department, with policymakers, where, it, frankly, it was just harder for us to ignore one another. Given that the merger was more for the sake of political expediency than anything else, it was not surprising to see some long-term consequences. Things got broken in the move. We lost a significant cadre of senior USIA leaders who did not want to work for the Department of State. The integration of the crosswalk of USIA elements into the department was something of a, a patchwork uh, approach. Different approaches for regional bureaus, different approaches for functional bureaus. You had su our support bureaus, uh, IIP, ECA, PA, um, only two of those bureaus, only two of those bureaus ended up with assistant secretaries at the helm. I think there was a statement there. The public diplomacy budget was initially firewalled off from the central state department budget in a move to create some security. There was always the talk of, you know, is it air conditioners for Ouagadougou or public diplomacy? Um, so we firewalled it off, but we did so at our, our I think it, we did some harm in the sense that it engendered some resentment on the part of USIA managers, or uh, sorry, the State Department managers who were all of a sudden told, here's your budget, but you can't touch this part of it. Right, so you, you, know, you, you have some shocks that were sort of built into this. And again, this is, um, a number of analogies have been, been put forward about the merger. Some say it was like grafting a foreign body onto a human body, and so you're gonna expect some antibody reaction. Um, an, another close friend of mine called it, I won't mention her name here, just for the sake of protection, but she said, this is sort of like putting a well person in a tuberculosis ward and hoping everybody gets better. <laughs> the fact is that those tasked with making this happen, um, I, I think, I, I'm not criticizing, again, these are simply observations, but things got broken in the merger. And then you also had some, I think, cultural differences. How do you handle information? How do you manage risk? Um, how do you evaluate performance? What are the skills we want to see in our senior officers? And the fact is that USIA's officers at the time of consolidation, for the most part, understood state work better than state officers understood USIA work. Um, and that was really more a function of the training we got under the USIA. We spent a year, or the better part of a year, rotating through state sections. So I mean, I think we walked into this merger with a better understanding than we saw on the other side of the table. Um, and again, this is not to criticize the senior managers who handled this process or the senior managers who have succeeded them. But what we have here is a, a, a consistent, chronic lack of understanding in the agency, in the department, of what public diplomacy could do um, because people were not experienced in it. And also, to be fair, I think public diplomacy practitioners didn't always do themselves credit in explaining the value they added. Um, if you can't explain to your ambassador why you're bringing a jazz group in, you're not doing your job. You need to make that connection. So I think we've got two-way communication that didn't happen. Um, so what came next then was, um, 
of course, 9-11. The dust had barely settled on the merger at, at when 9-11 happened, prompting sort of the dawning realization that maybe our retreat from the world in the form of a diminished PD presence contributed in some fashion to the mindset behind the attacks. But what came next, again, was the crisis, was the predictable response, a series of decisions about how our government would communicate with foreign audiences made in crisis, but again reflecting a collective under lack of understanding about public diplomacy. We saw a series of whole of government approaches to strategic communications with leadership ping-ponging between the White House and the State Department. DOD, meanwhile, had significant resources to expand their strategic communications efforts, and they did so. What resulted was increased confusion about what PD really is and who does it. There, is, there was no lasting strategy that came out of these efforts, uh, post 9-11 efforts, but we did see over 100 studies and analyses of how to fix this and to move forward. And all of this, to conclude, against a backdrop of the explosion of information technology and social media and a significantly changing international landscape. If we weren't sure what we wanted from PD before 9-11, the question was exponentially more complicated after that. Thank you. Boy, so there are several things I took away, and this is an observation, not a criticism. I'm going to use, thank you so much for that. I'll <laughs> use that. Um, Kevin Whitaker's. The, the, um, let me ask, I've got a question for the panelists. Could you each of you talk a little bit about the technology either that was in the 50s and 60s and how, techno how public diplomacy used technology? And then could you reflect a little bit about sort of, uh, let's call it the uh, radically changed uh, technology landscape? If I could, I'd be welcome each of you to comment on that. I'll start with you, Nick. Well, I think this is a, uh, this is a great question, Dan. And the, the way I see it, and I've, I've been thinking a lot about how new technologies come into public diplomacy, is that there's, there's a th I see it as a three-phase process. You have kind of a symbolic phase, then you have a phase where you use the technology to do what you've always done, and then you shake down to a phase where you actually look at what the capabilities of the new technology are, and you really think about how that technology can help you. Uh, for example, my example for the sort of symbolic phase is that when TV came out in the 40s, uh, the UN used it to put together a TV spectacular so, uh, uh, for TV in New York City, where all the different nations of the UN marched around with banners and had performers, and virtually nobody in New York City had a TV, but the fact that there'd been a TV special was reported in the newspapers and, um, <laughs> was, um, and became a story. In the same way, um, not so many people were on the Second Life platform, but when 10 years ago countries began opening embassies in Second Life, like the Maldives and Sweden and, and the US began doing things in Second Life, that became a story in legacy media and made those countries look um, better. Right now, I think we, we're moving from um, symbolic thing, hey, wow, my ambassador's tweeting, through a, uh, a phase where uh, new media is being used to smack people over the head kind of in broadcast mode. We're still waiting to see new media being used to really build relationships and to listen and to construct community as much to push out ideas and this is coming it's beginning but we're not we're not yeah there yeah we're not there yet and um, so I'm still holding my breath to see well how can we use social media actually to bring out the qualities of the of, of the um, communication form rather than just to use it as a as a, a, a platform for uh, sticking out the stuff that you do anyway, uh, like uh, tweeting out press releases or uh, your personal opinions, hashtag sad. <laughs> Regardless of the medium that you have, um, I think if you want to do something with political or public diplomacy that's more than just respond to a crisis, you have to build an audience, you have to establish your credibility, and so when you report on something, people are going to listen, and you can get through the white noise, and there's so much of it when you look at social media today. Whether it's the State Department or the USIA of the past, one of their challenges is when you're looking at new technology, radio, television, movies, uh, social media today, is how many platforms do I really need to be on? How many people at Voice of America should be tweeting in 45 different languages, different responses? 
um, how many official people from an embassy need to respond as well. Uh, and that's got to be part of the discussion, I think, that they have to have today. Um, during the 50s and 60s, we do see television as something, but it's very costly. Satellite communications is making its way into the developing world, but does USIA need to produce a large number of television shows, or is it better if you still use an older medium, uh, the film reel, and you make your documentaries and you push them out, in addition to the radio, because radio will always remain important. But one of the things, particularly in the 60s, they looked at and said, we're going to invest in the documentaries that we can have this newsreel, this documentary appear before a film in a foreign country, and that's probably going to reach more people than if we produce this thing for television just because we can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Even a longer term perspective on this issue of technology, I'm thinking of, I don't know what, smoke signals or, you um, know, I'll, I'll, I'll parchment, consolidate. paper, you know, the emergence of paper, this sort of thing. I promise to consolidate. Um, so I, I guess I would maybe call myself a bit of a, a technological agnostic when it comes to PD, um, just because from, again, from the breadth of history, um, you, I got to see where public diplomacy was changed at various points where new communication technology or just transportation improved. Um, the fact that transportation improved over the course of you know, US history with public diplomacy, um, another case from the American Revolution, um, one of the complaints that Benjamin Franklin made frequently to the Continental Congress was the lack of communication he was receiving from the Continental Congress in order to deflect British disinformation. And um, he was limited because he didn't, one, there was no packet ship or mail ship that the colonies controlled. And then when they did have a packet ship that they controlled, um, they were up against the British Navy and they were losing badly. Um, so information to and from the colonies to Benjamin Franklin made that communication difficult. So that would be like communication between the field and um, headquarters, which I'm sure some people serving at, in public diplomacy posts have shared similar frustrations about getting information to and from the field and how that affects what you actually put out in terms of public diplomacy. Um, but uh, going back to something that Nick said about the symbolic um, aspect of it is the, the frenzied approach to which we have reacted to new, new technology and what that actually means in real terms uh, for public diplomacy. Um, I'm you know, thinking about the conversations that were being had by um, private entities like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie en um, Endowment for International Peace with the advent of films before World War I and even after World War I where they saw it as these these films as an opportunity for um, education and public education and intercultural communication. Um, and I, I think that Hollywood today has kind of made it into some sort of major um, corporate um, enterprise. It's, it's, it doesn't have the same kind of um, cachet that it did at the turn of the century. And arguably, I've seen more recently in the press, um, I think last week there was an article um, accusing social media as the new robber barons of the United States. So I guess the question then becomes, you know, new technology, does that actually equate to, you know, actual um, relationships and meaningful public diplomacy along the lines of what Nick was saying um, and tailoring those technologies into something that's actually going to translate into two-way communications, relationships, um, and relationship building. Um, just actually a couple sentences because I agree with everything that's been said to date. Um, I, I recall being pulled into a meeting um, to create a public diplomacy strategy in 2009 for Pakistan. And of course, uh, on everyone's mind was how will we use social media um, in this, as a part of this program. And, and it was like, okay, well, let's, let's look at that possibility. Where do these people get their information? So we did the listening, if you will. We, we did the research and we found that actually most people in Pakistan at the time were getting their information by radio. Uh, which perhaps to the saner heads in the, in the room was an indication that maybe this isn't the tool that we need to use. And, and, and I think there is a tremendous temptation as these new tools come to light. And we see them you know, on our phones, in our pockets, and our, our purses all the time um, to gravitate to that. 
Um, but the fact is, in public diplomacy, they are, they are just a tool. They're a, a tool among many things. And I think most experienced PD practitioners will understand you can look at the, you can take that from the toolbox if it works in your country. The, the, uh, it, it, there may be tools that are better suited to your situation, but that requires the listening that we, we talk about. Um, the other is, is sort of the, the, the very strong sort of schizophrenia that the State Department has about information. Um, and getting information out into the world. And I say this with affection. I, I, you know, I, I have a long career with the department. Um, but in th this is not a culture where a thousand sh flowers should bloom. Um, as we saw uh, ambassadors you know, beginning to tweet, there was concern, was well, he going to run those tweets by Washington? Is PA going to have a look at those tweets before they go out? Of course, you know, uh, obviating the whole purpose of spontaneous communication and immediate communication. Um, it, it, it is, again, I think state slowly um, as, as Nick described far more eloquently than I, is slowly getting comfortable with the opportunities and limitations of the tool. Um, we are slow adapters, I think, in the Department of State. Most government agencies are. Um, and again, um, the question is, is this a useful tool? Um, is this a tool, and I love the way you put it, Caitlin, this is a tool that will augment our ability to create those platforms for mutually respectful conversation, or perhaps we need to seek another tool. I just want to jump back on this because I think that the issue in public diplomacy has changed fundamentally and we haven't really thought about it. The old school public diplomacy question was, what can I say to change this situation? Now, the question has to be, who can I empower to change the situation. Mm. And the, uh, what we have missed is that the social media platforms are creating a new generation of creative people who are very able to operate at a high level and build their own networks of audience. And I think this is gonna be the message of Parkland. People can't figure out how it could be that a, a group of uh, students in Florida could suddenly be super media savvy and able to hold their own in press conferences organized by CNN. They must have been coached personally by George Soros to be able to do this. Absolutely not. The reason they can do it is because they're 16, 17 years old in, 19, in uh, the year 2018. And any teenager or any random group of a thousand teenagers will have at least 20 who are able to put together their own documentaries and blog about themselves and have been doing so for probably have five years of experience. Um, so, uh, but the question is how do you then work in countries where they haven't had this experience to build up this kind of resource? And I feel that the inherent message of social media platforms has been lost. We are going to the more extreme versions and seeing them as somehow repress, repressive, exploitative, and missing the underlying trend, which is to, I think, a socially progressive inherent message in uh, in, in social media platforms. And the, 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 they are very, very much on uh, the, the same wavelength as the underlying values of the United States. And maybe people are gonna criticize the United States, but they're gonna be doing it in a dynamic way which will, under, in the long term, serve the things that this country should be about, which is personal expression and, uh, and democracy, that there is a, an inherent democratic, progressive, socially reforming quality to this media which we should embrace rather than throw out the baby with the bathwater because, oh my God, some bad people are using Facebook, some crazy people are using Twitter, uh, and uh, YouTube runs uh, horrible, uh, one or two horrible videos. Uh, if we fall for that one, we would close off this amazing avenue for really rebuilding and reaching out and uh, engaging public opinion around the world. Okay, so I have a question for everybody here. Uh, there's a issue of propaganda. There's something called the Smith-Munt Act. What is that? And how, does, how do we think about issues of propaganda as it relates to public diplomacy throughout history? Because I think it's evolved over time. Each one of you, I'd love to hear from each of you about that. Nick, why don't you start? Well, I see propaganda. What is Smith-Munt? Oh, well, Smith-Munt Act was a, uh, Smith-Munt Act is the authorizing legislation for American global engagement. Uh, it's been renewed and reformed over the years, but the most famous provision within Smith-Munt was something that was read into it and then written into it, uh, prohibiting American international propaganda from being received at home. So you couldn't listen to VOA broadcasts at home, you couldn't uh, view USIA films 
at home because uh, the, no one could imagine the federal government pro propagandizing the American people. This was unthinkable. Uh, and this was like a kind of a posse comitatus uh, for communication. Now, we now understand that the world is more complicated than this, that you can't prevent uh, the U federal government from propagandizing the American people. And it's actually quite good if some things develop for international audiences are audible at home because, well, a lot of international audiences are resident in the United States. Um, the case in point that really s called for reform of Smith Munt was the presence of Somali American communities who n work in Somali language. So why not make VOA Somalia available for those people? And that is now that's now possible. That's happened. In terms of uh, I see propaganda as being um, a, pro a public diplomacy's shadow. Propaganda is is a one way form that's designed to get to. Um, the uh, consent of an audience. Um, public diplomacy at its best is a two-way form, uh, which is as much about changing the, the transmitter as it is the person who is being en engaged. Uh, sometimes public diplomacy only gets funding because it is mistaken for propaganda by those who control, uh, who control the, the budget. I think that um, propaganda, I see propaganda as being a problem. Even propaganda in the best cause in the world can have unforeseen consequences, whereas public diplomacy, because of its two-way nature, is less likely to have unforeseen consequences, and people are less likely to mind the unforeseen consequences because they don't have the kind of persuadees remorse that you get when you feel you are sold a bill of goods by a propagandist. Best case in point is the feeling of anger on behalf of the American public after World War I when they realized how important British propagandists were in explaining the uh, problems of Nazi, uh, sorry, the problems of the Kaiser's Germany to um, American um, to American audiences. So uh, even though propaganda looks like a great solution to international persuasion, I think it's a mistake to go down that road. Public diplomacy takes longer, but it, it's like nonviolence in uh, a, a conflict situation. It, is, it, 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 it leads to a happier uh, solution okay. in the long term. And I see propaganda as being an inherently uh, violent approach to and morally wrong approach to um, public diplomacy, but that's just me. Other people will have other, con okay. other conclusions. Okay, so propaganda or Smith-Munt Act, what's your reaction to that? Well, one thing I like about the origins of the Smith-Munt Act is um, right before it was created in 1947, William Benton served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs, and he was very frustrated. In one letter he wrote, he said, I can find no one, as odd as it is, in the State Department with an understanding of this problem comparable to that already shown by General Marshall, General Eisenhower, and Bedell Smith. And these three generals have been very involved in what's going on in the development of uh, rebuilding Germany after World War II. And all three of them wrote a letter endorsing the Smith-Munt Act. And they wrote this letter saying, we want this not because they were concerned about directing propaganda towards the American people, but they said it would be criminal to provide aid to a foreign country without explaining the American motives. So these generals thought that this was something that was important. And propaganda does have a negative connotation, but if you actually read the documents, people still use that word, not in a negative light, up until 1965, uh, when it was public diplomacy was coined. Edward R. Murrow even said, I don't mind being called a propagandist, so long as the propaganda is based on truth. Uh, so part of the reason why I, I looked at the, the far past of U.S. public diplomacy was because of this stumbling block, at least from my optic, that we seem to have today with um, public diplomacy and propaganda. Uh, you have a kind of vehement um, and, you know, kind of disgusted response with the idea that the U.S. would use propaganda. Um, in order to um, kind of manipulate people into agreement or into doing something that would maybe be against what they would, in their interests, basically. Um, and I wanted to understand, you know, in the American context, what, you know, is there a distinction to be made between propaganda and public diplomacy? And I, admittedly, when I went into the research, I actually did not think there was a difference between propaganda and public diplomacy. Um, it was through the research, looking back at what Benjamin Franklin did in France 
and the, um, some of the efforts that were done in Britain during the Civil War, and um, private citizens um, in the interwar period, that my view about the differences between propaganda and public diplomacy changed. I believe there is actually a difference along the lines of the one that Nick outlined. There is a level of transparency um, that comes along with public diplomacy. And um, again, going back to my initial statements about dipl public diplomacy being, in fact, diplomacy, um, I think that through modern um, understanding of what diplomacy is, which effectively coalesced around the turn of the 20th century. If you go back before that, I, I, I would argue that diplomacy included diplomacy with people. Um, and when you think about public diplomacy as a diplomatic act, rather than simply in the context of communication as it as it is traditionally understood, if you look at the history, uh, a lot of the literature written on public diplomacy, it's always in the context of communication and communication media and stuff like that. Very rarely do you see the connection made between public diplomacy and diplomacy, the behavior of diplomacy. Um, and I think that's really where that distinction lies. I also say, too, that in the context of the United States, uh, you know, other nations may have different views on this. Um, obviously, they have different views on propaganda, but specifically within the context of the United States, I think that our national values just prohibit us from using propaganda um, as a tool um, in that way. I think that um, public diplomacy is more in keeping with national values and who we represent abroad um, and what, we st what people see us as abroad. And we, and we get into trouble with our policies when those when those values and our diplomacy don't, don't match when they um, are in contradiction to each other. Um, again, I agree with my colleagues here. Um, one of the things that I do, um, usually the first week in the classes that I teach, is to sort through um, public affairs, public diplomacy, public relations, propaganda, information operations, um, because I think sometimes it tends to be just this word cloud and people think all of the terms are interchangeable and they're not. Um, I absolutely agree that um, there's a, a, dis a significant distinction between propaganda and public diplomacy. It, it, and it's based on the, the purpose of, pu of public diplomacy, which is to, to create that mutual relationship, a long-term two-way relationship between an American voice and foreign voices. Um, and, to, and I think critical to establishing and maintaining that relationship um, is, is the two-way function, but is also the credibility. I think at some point people will just write you off if they think they can't trust what you're saying. Okay, Betsy, I'm going to start with you, and we're going to go this way, uh, and then I'm going to open it up. So Richard Holbrook famously wrote after 9-11 an important op-ed about get the message out, and he asked several questions. The one that I think is the most memorable is, um, uh, how can a man in a cave out communicate the world's communication society? So I'd like to hear from each of you as to what is your answer to that question, or what's your reaction to that? Um, a valid question, um, especially articulated when it was, when I think uh, we were still trying to figure out what to do with uh, with social media and with, um, with an increasingly connected world. Um, I, I, I hearken back to, speaking of Smith Munt for just a second, in the early days of the internet uh, in the 1990s when the U.S. Information Agency was struggling with what to do with this. Uh, we, have, we have the internet, we have websites, we think we should be created, but what are we going to do to balance that with Smith Munt? And our, our solution at the time was to create, as some of you will recall, an internally facing website and an externally facing website. We were not allowed to give the addresses of one to our to different audiences at the time. So I, I see that as sort of emblematic. We got better, let me just say that. It all got better. Um, but we, we struggled with trying to adapt to that reality. And I think you know what, what Ambassador Holbrook was getting at was that we sometimes see other populations, other communicators out there who are much more agile, much more adept than governments are for all kinds of understandable reasons on both sides. But I think he was saying, we've got to get smarter about that. Okay, so Betsy, if you had no budget constraint and you had a magic wand and you could fix at whatever gap, whatever, you, you, you've studied this for a long time, you've been in the business a while, what are two or three simple things you would do 
to improve America's public diplomacy capabilities? Oh, wow. <laughs> Assuming one of them would be appoint somebody for the undersecretary job and, and make sure that that person stays for two or three years right? at least, yeah. right? I think the average tenure has been about 12 months in right. the last 10 years. It has been, in effect, a, a rotating, uh, a revolving door. I can never get that phrase right. Um, a, a revolving door. I think we do need consistent leadership. Um, and I think when we have good leadership, and I would, I would point to one example in particular, and I will confess I worked for her um, for two years, Judith McHale, who came in. Um, who had sort of a, um, a, a realist um, structural view of what structures do we need to conduct public diplomacy, um, would that she had stayed on longer. So I think, I, you know, what I would suggest is let's first of all get somebody who understands public diplomacy, and as I started the session, th those are kind of few and far between, but let's find that person. I'm available, by the way. <laughs> um, so I think you need sustained leadership for more than a year, more than 18 months. Um, I think you also need a, a significant sustained program of education, both within the building, within the State Department, and within the government. Um, about what public diplomacy uh, is and how to use it if you're, if you're a non-public diplomacy diplomat? Exactly right. And what, you know, let, let's, let's shape expectations and let's also alert them to, to Nick's point, you know, which is, you know, we've, we've got to stop lurching from crisis to crisis. There, there's no consistency. We, we don't learn from the, hist from the lessons of history as a result. And so we find ourselves reinventing things all the time. When I hear, frankly, people saying we really need to recreate USIA, I want to tear my hair out. You know, please stop. Don't reorganize us anymore. Let the structures stay. But let's get people who in inhabit and work in those structures and who finance them, who, who consider the funding, who, who, who are going to make these big decisions about the future of public diplomacy. Let's make them smarter. Okay, so let me, Caitlin, this question about how can a guy in a cave out communicate the world's greatest communication society? And then also, what's your What's your one, if you had a magic wand, what's the one thing you'd fix? Um, to the, the cave question, um, I will cite a, a letter that uh, bin Laden actually wrote to Mullah Mansour Omar, um, Mullah, not Mullah Man. MMO, Mullah Omar, the first guy of the Taliban, he said that um, not, um, jihad, 90% 90, 90 of jihad is uh, information. Um, and that right there should tell us something. Um, the, the, those responsible for 9-11 and subsequent U.S. foreign policy to date um, prioritize the role of information in their relationship with the rest of the world. And at least from my optic in, in looking at public diplomacy, there, are, there is a small contingency of us who would like to see public diplomacy per prioritized but I don't think I have seen it prioritized at the levels of government it would need to be prioritized for us to out-communicate uh, a terrorist group. Um, and um, I would like to see that happen. I don't know how you make that happen, but uh, you know, somebody at the upper levels of government needs to take the proverbial bull by the horn and make it a priority for the entirety of the US government. And that would get to my magic wand, I have unlimited resources, um, kind of building on what um, Elizabeth commented on uh, educating the entire pub, um, you know, State Department. I would actually argue that because of the nature of communications today that, you know, the, and how fast communications work, it's having that awareness across the government that what you say and no matter where you are, has the potential to go international. So your, your flippant tweet, your flippant comment to a local reporter um, has the potential to ha take on a life of its own. And just having that presence of mind that is a fit, an official of the US government, you are constantly representing the US government and by virtue of that, the United States. Um, and just to me, in, in looking at this, I think that's a piece that unfortunately has escaped a lot of um, U.S. political leaders, as well as even some of the lower echelons of U.S. government. When I see on the nightly news someone's flippant tweet or remark to somebody um, unguarded has now become an international kind of topic of news, um, maybe not reflecting the United States in the best way. Um, 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we represent the United States, whether we realize it or not. Um, and people just need to be mindful of that. Uh, we've made a lot of observations, not criticisms, about the State Department today. Uh, but I actually want to pick up on this idea of educating the whole of government to understand this and the responsibility to, to ensure that that guy in the cave is not the person who's getting over all the other white noise. Um, and in my day job as an Army officer, I've been observing this since 2002 when I was an information operations officer in Kosovo. And I'm asking for messages and guidance. And has anyone talked to the State Department? And no, they're kind of doing their own thing. They're out of the embassy. So, but we're here on the ground. We're doing radio shows in Albania and Serbian. And why aren't we in sync with them? And so it has to be that at the combatant command level, when we're doing these exercises, um, we are getting those messages. And we're trying to figure out how to work them in. A uh, year and a half ago, I was in Canada for a month for a NATO exercise, and I kind of usurped their whole engagement information operations campaign. And it got so hard and it frustrated so many people in Norway, for some reason Norway was running the cyber war, that they closed it down. And, and I said, that's not right. Because in military operations and training exercises, if you don't destroy all the enemy air defense systems, you don't just turn them off when the pilots start flying over with the bombers. Your bombers are going to crash and burn because you failed to do that. But we look at engagement. We look at information operations as something too hard. It's something the State Department kind of does, and maybe we can dabble in it. We have to take it seriously. Um, and we have to bring that into all of our training and the education process, not just for the diplomats. Well, when the I cave do, the cave, well, when I look at Osama bin Laden, I, I see somebody who was strong because he knew one thing. Uh, it's kind of like that uh, proverbial duel between the hedgehog and the fox. That Osama bin Laden was like the hedgehog; he only had to do one thing, and you know, curl up in a ball and talk about what was wrong with the United States that it was uh, in uh, uh, crusader troops on Islamic land, supporter of the people of Israel, and a. Um, uh, ally of the apostate regimes. What's, what shocks me about Osama bin Laden's broadcasts is that they were so little read in, with inside the beltway. People were following Al Jazeera. There were six teams in the US government who were monitoring Al Jazeera 24-7, but people weren't listening to what uh, Osama bin Laden said, either before 9-11 or afterwards. He was, there, he was seen as a kind of an icon that they were against. Um, you know, he said some really interesting things. You know, if he said, President Bush says that I hate freedom. It's not true. If I hated freedom, I'd make jihad against Sweden. I hate, and then he would list the things that he hated. The United States has a disadvantage because it has to be the fox. It has to be about many things. And it has to represent a wide variety of interests. And so if you have to be the fox, I would suggest you make friends with hedgehogs. Find hedgehogs who can be about one thing in the areas where you need to be. So I, I think we need a public diplomacy that's about empowerment. Where the United States has had an advantage in the past was being the country that was about the future. When I look at the two or the three great crises of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, each of those was solved when the United States was able to articulate a vision of the future so attractive that not only their allies wanted to buy into it, but the enemies wanted to buy into it too. And the strength of the vision articulated by Woodrow Wilson, by, uh, by Franklin Roosevelt, by Ronald Reagan, was so strong that people could see the value in it. And right now, I don't see the, the vision. And, we, in, and if we don't have a vision of the future to aim at, then people fall back on a vision of the past. And the, our past is strengthening all kinds of or Or, 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 the, or some other, someone else will step into the vacuum like the Chinese and say, how about, yeah, one, that's, belt, one, how about one belt, one road? Absolutely. Uh, so right. uh, this is the, the importance of articulating a vision of the future that everyone could buy into. In World War I, in the depth of World War I, when the British were trying desperately to think, who do we have who can communicate with the Germans? They had an entire literary galaxy of stars they could call on. The person they contacted to communicate with the Germans was H.G. Wells, mm. because they knew that he had a way of talking about the future which Germans would find interesting. And absolutely, he did a terrific job. Problem was, 
that then the uh, governments were unable collectively to deliver on the, what they would promised German people. But right now, we need to be thinking about visions of the future. We need to be thinking about the people whose visions will resonate with international audiences. We need to be calling people like Elon Musk, uh, who have tremendous followings internationally, yes. and trying to reorient the United Trump. States, that's right, around uh, the best vision of the future. Because America's future is what resonates with international audiences, not the past. We don't want to make the country great again. We want to make the world great for the first time and for everybody. That's what's worked in the past, and that's what I think will, uh, needs to be, we need to reconnect to at this particular juncture. So I've now, I want to hear from, so I want to see hands if people want to comment or ask questions. I want to make sure my friend Ambassador Robinson, I call my friend Ambassador Robinson and this gentleman and someone else. I'm going to get, I got slots for, I got three slots. It can't be all dudes. So <laughs> like a little gender balance here, folks. Come on, work with me. Okay, if not, I'll, I'll call on this gentleman here. So, so no one can, okay, so it's going to be Ambassador Robinson and these two gentlemen up here. You, you're first, Ambassador Robinson. Okay. <clears throat> I don't want to talk to the back of everybody's head. I'm in the last row. <clears throat> first, I want to compliment the, Dan, you for having this conference, and everybody said something very uh, incisive <clears throat> from my point of view. Um, I'm going to say something that's uh, not commonly accepted, and that is I think that the, um, one of the worst decisions the government of the United States ever made is to do away <clears throat> with USIA. There was a conservative Republican senator and the Democratic Senate, uh, Secretary of State who agreed on that, and it was absolutely, in my opinion, wrong. <clears throat> I think that um, two of you up here, one of you uh, talk, talked about uh, education and, uh, and um, also some of the new ideas that you needed up here. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I think that has not been said uh, here uh, has to do with all of us in the room. How many of you were, if you'd raise your hand, it, either in a Democrat or a Republican administration, doesn't matter which, uh, who served at one time in any capacity in government? Okay, that's a lot. <clears throat> so I'm going to make one suggestion, and which I'm going to do. In the last two weeks, um, Information warfare has become kind of the words. Um, Mueller used them when he indicted the 13 Russians for <laughs> spreading information warfare, and it has been used um, by others uh, here. Um, Jim Lewis, who is with CSIS, <coughs> uh, used it not uh, more than two weeks ago in a speech at the Metropolitan Club. So I think <coughs> that we all know that where policy comes from is the top. The top is the White House. There is nobody in the White House that has the title special advisor to the president for public diplomacy, nor in the, in the National Security Council. I'm going to suggest to <coughs> McMaster's, if I can get to him, uh, that he have a special advisor <coughs> or one of his deputies with the title of public diplomacy. That'll force <clears throat> the issue uh, in many areas, many directions. If anybody wants to join me, uh, Dan Rundy has my number. It's Ambassador Gilbert Robinson, 703-380-3800, my cell phone. <clears throat> Call me and we'll organize a stampede to make politics into policy because it's with the elected officials that the policy begins. And I think we all can help to turn this thing around. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Gil. Let me, uh, I want to hear from the two folks here. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Could you please stand up? Uh, I'm Michael Quare from Retired Foreign Service Officer. I just wanted to comment on uh, something you might want to add to your consideration as you look at the history of uh, public diplomacy. I joined the Foreign Service in 1979, and in those days, I joined an organization called the International Communication Agency. It, it wasn't USIA. 
And uh, what really struck me in those days was that there was an intellectual coherence to what we were trying to do. At the time that ICA was founded, there were a lot of documents, a lot of founding documents, that tried to uh, create a framework in which we would work, how we would communicate with other audiences, and so on. And it seems to me that uh, after, you know, four years later when we became USIA again, um, we sort of lost some of that. Uh, I did also want to just mention about the uh, history of USIA and, and ICA, that it wasn't until 79 and uh, the creation of ICA that CU, the um, Education and Cultural Affairs, came back uh, to public diplomacy. And so that's worth remembering that there was a period there when exchanges and so on, at least in Washington, not necessarily in the field, uh, were uh, separate from uh, the work that U USIS was doing abroad. Can I make a quick comeback on that? Let me, for just, let me just capture this other comment. Yep. From this gentleman. Well, this is not a comment. This is a question. I'm just, I'm just wondering. There's a currently existing uh, broadcasting board of governors. There are five media agencies. So I want to know what the panel thinks in terms of what are the shortcomings currently? Why is, why is the current construct not delivering what we need? Thank you. Okay, so each of the panelists, Nick, you can respond to any, any and all, and I'll just go down the, down the row. Uh, I think that regarding USICA, it's a very interesting moment in the history of public diplomacy when it was rethought during the Carter years. Uh, excitingly, they were given a new a second mandate to explain American opinion to Americans. Uh, downside was nobody thought that this might need a budget. And mysteriously in government, if it don't have a budget, it doesn't happen or it happens only, only to a very small degree. And this is one of the tragedies. Uh, maybe ICA had some great ideas, uh, but um, it, it wasn't allowed, it wasn't funded. And Sorry, Nick, so just what's the, if you were gonna set the 30 second uh, elevator pitch for the vision of the world to get people to get behind, what's that, what's that message right now? In, in terms of, you know, after, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of going Chinese. Yeah, let me, right? yeah, yeah and, and uh, uh, when I get into the Cave of Wonders, I should just bring out the magic lamp bring and bring it directly to you. Yes. And, uh, yeah. No, but I, I think this is actually, I think this is the critical question. I think I'm going to, I'm going to be here for the next couple of years, and I think that question you put is actually one of the most important questions I've heard in a really long time. And, you know, I do this for a living. I do like 50 or 60 of these a year. That's a pretty darn smart question. So, like, what's the vision we're gonna put forward to get people to feel like they're empowering, sort of it's aligned with their vision and their hopes and their aspirations. Because if we don't do it, the Chinese are gonna do it and that's what's gonna happen. But that's I think that view. the answer to that question comes not from a professor, but from the people. And we need to be out talking to the people and getting to know the people and getting to think about what their values are. And um, what shocks me is the extent to which Things that the Russians are saying, articulation of conservative values, are chiming with international opinion around the world, and that the, the Russians have soft power from a regressive and repressive agenda. And uh, so I think that um, it's a, it should be a priority uh, okay. to, to uh, listen, and that whatever the, the, the vision of the future has to be uh, at least informed by what, what people care about. However, we do know something about what everyone cares about. The UN did a survey around the Millennium Development Goals to, yeah, I've got Global Pulse, Bob Wars thing, and he found that everybody in the world can't agree on what the most important thing is, but everybody in the world thinks the second most important thing is education. Wow. And the US has, uh, is a market leader in education. And so I would recommend uh, a vision that's around a partnership for education uh, and, and having a vision about educating the, educating the world because the world wants American style education, not Chinese style education where you're sitting down uh, all writing with your right hand. Yeah. Uh, and you know, that's where this country has a, an absolute yeah. leadership and can, uh, you know, as long as, uh, as long as you keep guns out of schools, the, yeah, you know, the on, US, is, uh, the US has an amazing uh, global leadership in education. Thank you. I, I have a hard time. I mean, I don't see a lot of people banging down the door saying, oh, God, I really want to move to China. I really want to move to Beijing. Now, people do it. For, and if you give me an expat package, they will. But no one's like, oh, I will take a boat and come and sneak in illegally to China. I don't know anybody who's doing that. Now, this is something. But anyways, Greg. Uh, to get to the question about inadequacies of the BBC, I think 
or BBG, excuse me. Freudian slip. <laughs> so it, 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 you got a defibrillator. <laughs> oh my God. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> it, it, the, the funding, the inadequacy of the funding, and question the ability, do we balance enough of the information with the programs they provide with the cultural stuff that was so appealing in the past? And that was one of the points of conversation at the Public Diplomacy Council at the beginning of this month uh, when they were talking about this at VOA, and one of the people in the audience there suggested, let's do this thing called What's Cooking USA? Cooking is very popular on American television. Why don't we use that? like we used to use jazz ambassadors in the 50s and rock and roll in the 80s. Um, but I did want to point out a couple of things I think are positive that the BBG are doing right now. Um, uh, current time as a response to what RT and Radio Sputnik are doing um, is absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, we talk about propaganda and public diplomacy, totally different things, got that. But what the Russians are doing today is not the same as the propaganda of the Cold War. I think it's much more sophisticated. It's not as plastic. And it has to do with putting this disinformation out there that causes you just to question things that you would never have questioned in the past. And I think current time is something very positive in trying to counter that, as well as polygraph.org that the VOA provides, that you can go online and see what the Russians are saying. Am I responding to the BBG or like the future? <laughs> Um, um, I, I can't really speak to the BBG question um, overall, but I do know from my work um, looking at um, counterterrorism um, that uh, the Voice of America tends to uh, be, I think it's like ranked number one, sometimes number two. It competes with BBC um, as the number one uh, news source of Afghans. So to me, that would indicate that it's doing something right. Um, on, on the future thing, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Nick. Um, I think that, um, you know, while sometimes throughout American history, the, the, um, the ideals of America sometimes tripped us up in terms of public diplomacy and what we projected abroad, um, I think that where we can be successful is this notion that everybody has a voice in what the future holds. Um, and really listening to that. And I think in, in listening, it really needs to be that constructive listening. We can't just sit there and say, yeah, we're gonna listen. You need to take that on board and say, okay, this person really does have a, right, a, a good idea. And then as Nick says, empowering those people that um, have the ability to come up with a vision that may be you know, actually attainable for the future um, and, and using what the U.S. has been known for in the past as being a coalition or a coalescing of disparate groups coming together to solve problems and overcome problems um, and, and creating a vision for the future. Um, I, I think one of the things that would be key to the future, to doing it better, is um, we as a government need to explain what diplomacy is to the American people. I think the State Department, again, with all due respect, has done a very poor job of creating a constituency for its work uh, among the American people. Um, and the fact is that we actually do have constituencies. We have those who, those communities that, that support uh, international visitors, I mean, that, that welcome students who are studying in the United States. I mean, the, there are these pockets all, all over the United States, but I don't think they're, they're knit together in any way. And there's been no real effort to explain to the American people why, why diplomacy Paren, especially public diplomacy, but public diplomacy in general is important to American interests. And I think um, the more we go out and have those conversations, the more we listen to them um, to help them understand what it is we do um, and why we do this, why, why we give ourselves to service um, to do these things. I think then, then you, begin to cre you, you begin to shape the vision that we take forward uh, overseas. I think it's a better, it's a more informed vision. So we, we need to listen overseas as has been described here, absolutely. We need to listen better and we need to be more flexible and responsive. We, we also need to start listening and telling our story to the American people. Okay, please join me in thanking the panelists.